All right, we are live. Hey there, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Live video chat for Friday, June the 7th. Now, before I get going, I want to make sure that this is coming through loud and clear. So if you can hear me, if you can see me, please let me know and type into the video chat window so that I know everything is up and running and working the way that it's supposed to before I get into answering your questions and everything today. So if you could do that, I would greatly appreciate it. Just getting a few... Uh, few things organized here on my end. Make sure that this is up and running. Let us see, let us see. Scroll down, scroll down. Loud and clear, loud and clear. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Always wanna make sure because sometimes technology doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And it can be quite, uh, Quite a nuisance when that happens. <laughs> All right. So the way these video chats work is I'm basically going to hang out here on Google Hangouts and answer any questions that you may have with regards to fitness and nutrition, building muscle, <laughs> losing fat. Uh, if there's any specific challenges that you're dealing with when it comes to your workouts or your nutrition program, be that with building muscle, losing body fat, hey, feel free to t post those questions and topics of discussion in our video chat window there, and I'll do my best to get to those during our chat today. Uh, I also have a couple things that I want to share with you as well. I posted a new blog today covering some strategies for how you can manipulate your diet and how you can manipulate your caloric intake without actually counting calories. And what this is, it's a strategy for uh, controlling your appetite. And this is critical because the reason we, we struggle with what, whatever it is, whether it's losing body fat or struggling with, with gaining muscle, it usually comes down to diet. And it's not so much that not knowing what to eat. I mean, you can go on Google, you can go on YouTube, and you can find you know all kinds of calorie calculators. You can figure out your macros and all that. But the problem is, is figuring out how to structure your meals in such a way that you're getting eating satisfaction and staying within those macro and calorie guidelines. That's the hard part. So I want to cover some strategies, some that's kind of like a sneaky strategies that you can use to manipulate your diet, manipulate your food intake that will make it a lot easier to stay within your desired calorie and macro nutrient range without having to force yourself or without causing discomfort because I mean it's like when it comes to fat loss if, if you can have a diet where you are satisfied and comfortably full then that makes things so much easier I mean nobody wants to go feeling hungry or feeling deprived or on the flip side if you're trying to bulk up and gain muscular body weight nobody wants to be feeling bloated and sluggish and trying to force feed food I mean both ends of these spectrums are, are equally challenging in their own respective rights. I mean, if, if you are a skinny guy and you're struggling to put on muscle, it's just as difficult to gain weight as it is for someone who's overweight to lose weight. Now, I know a lot of people who are overweight, which it's the vast majority of people, especially in North America. I mean, the average, like in North America, at least, like overweight is the new average right? Overweight is the new normal. So if you are normal, then you're fat. <laughs> fat is normal now. I mean, it's, it's, that's the way we are. So if you want to be better than average, better than normal, then you want to get down to an ideal body fat level. And that is just as challenging for someone who's overweight to get lean as it is for someone who's underweight to gain size. So I'll be covering some strategies for that. Again, I just want to do a little quick uh, scan here, make sure everything is good. Okay, all the audio is coming through good. We've got lots of people joining us live, a lot of regulars. If you are new to the video chat, please type in the letter N. The letter N on your keyboard there. Let me know if you're new. If you are a regular, type in the letter R. Again, I recognize a lot of the regulars because we do get a lot of the same, same crew showing up. But it's always nice to have new people tuning in, and I always want to encourage new people to join us. 
And if you haven't already done so, make sure to head on over to my website at leehayward.com. And there's several things that you can do to stay up to date with all the content that I'm putting out. One is download a copy of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app. This is like a an awesome resource that you can have right on your smartphone covering the fundamentals of training and nutrition. Again, it's something you can download from uh, iTunes for Apple devices. You can download it from the Google Play Store for Android devices. And it's an awesome resource. I highly recommend you get a copy if you haven't already done so. Download the Total Fitness Bodybuilding app. Direct link to it right on my website, leehayward.com. And I also recommend that you sign up for some of the free reports that I'm offering. I have free workout programs, free sample diet plans, all that kind of stuff available over on leehayward.com. Again, this is going to provide you with the fundamentals that you need to start moving yourself in the right direction. And again, it's a great resource to help you. All right, so let's jump into that strategy that I was talking about. And if you want to follow along, you can head on over to leehayward.com. And it's the very first blog post that's there right now. And it's titled, How to Lose Weight Without Counting Calories. And what it has to do is choosing your foods based on taste and texture. Now, this is something a lot of people don't focus on. But once I explain it, it's going to be like, duh, this makes perfect sense. If, if you think of when you're eating a meal, and I'm going to give you an example here. Let's say you're out to a family dinner, you know, maybe like a Thanksgiving dinner. It could be a Christmas Day dinner. It could be a birthday or some big celebration, you know, Fourth of July is coming up, right? So, I mean, it could be one of these big events where you get together with your family and friends. And during that time, the diet goes out the window, right? You're going to eat whatever it is that you want to eat that day, right? There's, there's no... No counting calories, no counting macros on, on, on these big family dinners or when you're having a big old cheat meal. Uh, but what often happens is, I mean, you might stuff yourself on appetizers. You might stuff yourself on the main course, whatever that is. You know, it could be a big cooked dinner with, you know, or maybe a big, you know, like if it's a Christmas or Thanksgiving, you know, the turkey, the mashed potatoes, the, 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 the pumpkin pies, whatever, all that kind of stuff. You're going to stuff yourself with all kinds of good stuff there. And you eat until you can't eat another bite and you feel absolutely full, stuffed. Oh, I can't eat another bite. And then a few minutes later, someone says, hey, anybody want some desserts, right? We've got, you know, a homemade apple pie and ice cream, or we've got, you know, homemade chocolate cake or fresh baked cookies, whatever it is. Soon as you're offered dessert, what happens? Even though you were stuffed and couldn't eat another bite a few minutes earlier, all of a sudden you magically make room for dessert. Just, I mean, how often does that happen to you? I'm sure everybody can relate to this. If, if you can relate to that, type in the word dessert in the chat window. If you can, if you've ever made room for dessert, even though you've been stuffed from the main course previously. If that has happened to you, what the reason for that is because you weren't physically full from the food or the calories or anything like that. It's you were full of that taste and texture of food. But once you introduce a new taste and a new texture of food, your appetite is stimulated all over again. So that's why you can eat your main course and get full. But then once you switch to something sweet and tasty, dessert, you make room all over again. Now you can use this to your advantage because uh, first off, if you're bulking up and trying to gain weight, uh, an easy way to do this for those of you who struggle to get enough calories in is to have a lot of variety in your meals. Instead of trying to make all your calories come from, you know, just one source of protein, just one source of carbohydrates, just one source of vegetables, you can mix it up. So maybe have two or three different sources of protein within the one meal. Uh, prime example, you know, steak and eggs right? Two totally different protein sources, two totally different textures, different tastes. So you could eat more if you combine two different foods because you're getting different tastes, different texture. When it comes to the carbohydrates, having different sources of carbohydrates in there increases the likelihood that you can eat more food. So if you're having, uh, you know, say like it was potatoes and rice, or maybe it was pasta and bread, 
or something like that where you're combining multiple different foods together, you actually can eat more food. Uh, same with the vegetables. If you have, say, like a garden salad, plus you're having some steamed vegetables or maybe some stir-fried vegetables, you could eat more vegetables if you have different sources of vegetables. Now, where is this beneficial and how can we use this strategy? Well, like I mentioned, for bulking up and gaining muscular body weight, it's easy because you just combine different foods so that you don't get full from just one food source. I mean, if, if you're trying to follow the typical bodybuilding bro diet, you know, like chicken, rice, and broccoli, let's say, and you're trying to bulk up on chicken, rice, and broccoli, it's painful. Like a lot of people just don't have the appetite to eat that much. But if you split it up and have different food sources, it makes it easier to get that volume of food in that you need to be in a caloric surplus to gain muscular body weight. On the flip side, we can use the opposite approach if you want to control your calories. So if you want to limit the amount of food that you consume, then have just one source of protein, have just one source of complex carbohydrates, just one source of veggies. And what happens is you'll get full on those foods and you'll actually be satisfied. You'll actually leave the table feeling comfortably full uh, without introducing another food. So again, when, when it comes to that Thanksgiving, if you had a stopped at just the main course, you would eat less overall calories if you know someone didn't introduce you to, hey, anybody got room for dessert? Because as soon as they offer the dessert, now all of a sudden you just stimulated your appetite all over again with a new source of food. So use that to your advantage. And again, if you want to read more about it, just head on over to my blog and I go into all the different tastes that we have. And there's five key tastes. We've got sweetness, we've got sour, salty, bitter, and savory. So those tastes, if you combine them in the right way or limit them in the right way, you can naturally manipulate your caloric intake without being a slave to counting the calories. Now, even if you follow this, calories do count. You can't get away from calories in versus calories out. It is still the ultimate equation when it comes to either gaining or losing weight. But you can use this to your advantage so that you are comfortably full whether you're trying to bulk up or whether you're trying to lose fat. And this is a, an awesome strategy. I've implemented myself, you know, when, when I was younger trying to bulk up. Now that I'm older and trying to maintain or lose weight, I use it to the opposite way to help control my appetite. And it, again, it's a great strategy to use and it can really help to move you in the right direction without making you uncomfortable. Because again, the, the, the key that's gonna make or break a, a diet for you is comfort. If you can be comfortable and have eating satisfaction, you can stick to it for the long term. But if you have to suffer and feel like you're deprived, you're not going to stick to it long. I mean, you'll stick to it for so long, but eventually willpower is going to run out, right? You're going to run out of willpower sooner or later and then give in to, you know, your cravings. So you have to structure your meals in such a way that you get that eating satisfaction. And this is just one of many strategies that you can use, and it's a very powerful one. Now, if you'd like some more help with this, you know, planning out a meal plan for your individual goals, your individual body type, and of course, your food preferences, shoot me an email at leeh at leehayward.com, and I'll be more than happy to chat about this with you, and we can kind of brainstorm some strategies that are right for you. So again, that's, that's an open offer to anybody. If you want some help with this, just send me an email, and I'll be more than happy to discuss this with you. All right, guys, let's jump into some of the questions that are coming through here. Let's see what we got here. We've got Sean joining us. Ross is joining us. We have uh, uh, someone who's called the fake Natty is joining us. Uh, who else? Uh, gee, we've got a lot of the regulars. Jesse. G or G or G, I think it is. Okay, wayward woodworker. Gotcha. Muhammad's joining us. Karen. Gotcha. Rick is joining us. Excellent. Nice to have you guys. All right. First question. Uh, Lee, my friend says he's getting stronger while cutting. He says he's losing weight every week and apparently his lifts are going up. Is that impossible? Uh, should I stop being friends with him? Because he's a liar. Uh, no, that's not necessarily right or wrong. It really depends on the individual. If someone is new to working out, they can be on a fat loss cutting diet and still make strength gains. If someone's coming back to the gym after a layoff, they can be on a fat loss cutting diet and still make strength gains, meaning you can build muscle and lose body fat simultaneously. 
Uh, sometimes people actually make progress while cutting because they're just so much more consistent with their workouts, more consistent with their nutrition, more consistent with everything. So you can make progress in terms of building muscle, gaining strength while losing body fat. So it's, it's, it really depends on the individual and their situation. Where this kind of gets tricky is when people are more advanced and they're transitioning from, you know, in the advanced stages where you're going from lean to ripped, as in like a contest bodybuilder who's in the final phases of a contest diet or someone who's, you know, like fitness model getting ready for a photo shoot or something along those lines where they're really depleting themselves in order to get absolutely shredded. You know, to go from lean to shredded you're not going to gain muscle and lose fat simultaneously. You know, you're going to have to kind of like tip the scales one or the other. So in order to make that extreme transition, chances are you're probably going to sacrifice a little bit of size and strength in the process of getting ultra shredded. Vice versa, if someone's trying to maximize their strength, they're probably going to have to put on a little bit of extra weight in the process of maximizing their size and strength. That's why you see a lot of power lifters who are, you know, really pushing the limits, they typically got a bit of extra weight on because that extra weight actually helps with their strength. But for the average person who's, like say, just getting started or coming back to the gym after a layoff, or maybe you just, you know, you've been on and off or half ass with your workouts, but you're now getting strict and consistent, you can build muscle and lose fat simultaneously with a structured program. But you have to realize that it's not gonna last forever, right? Every program eventually is gonna hit a plateau and when you do, then you really need to start digging into those fine details and figuring out, okay, what do you need to manipulate next in order to take your physique to the next level, whether that's the next level of fat loss, the next level of muscle growth, or whatever it is that you're training for. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, another question. This one we've got a, a says he's a 16-year-old. He's a skinny freshman was thinking about jumping on a quick cycle of Tran and Diana Paul, oh my Jesus, uh, for some lean muscle gains for next year's football tryouts. What are your thoughts? You're 16 years old. Why? <laughs> like, at 16 years old, your natural hormones are at their absolute peak. You're not going to have higher levels of natural testosterone, natural growth hormone, uh, natural thyroid and all these metabolic hormones. I mean, everything is at its natural peak. All you need to do is focus on consistency with your training, consistency with your nutrition, and let your body grow. If you start adding in synthetic hormones at this stage, you're going to screw up your own natural hormone production. And I mean, yes, you probably would make some progress, but ultimately it's, it's going to screw you up long term. I mean, you're not going to have any natural base to work from. So it's a bad idea all around. All right, moving on. Um, can I build muscle at the age of 29? Is it too late for me to build muscle? Please help. <laughs> no, you can still build muscle at any age. And quite honestly, 29, I mean, that's far from over the hill. I, I know guys who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. In fact, one of my coaching students that I'm working with now, I believe he's 65 years old, and he just started working out within the last few years. And he's making some great progress. Now, at the same time, he kind of regrets the fact that he didn't start working out earlier, but he's thankful that he started working out now. So here he is, 65 years old and making progress. So it's it's never too late to make improvements. Now, he's not going to become a, you know, a competitive bodybuilder or like maximize his ultimate muscle building potential if you're starting that late, but you can still make progress. I mean, it's it's... It's like the analogy of when's the best time to plant a tree? Well, the best time would have been 20 years ago. The second best time is today, right? You're 29, you're never gonna be as young as you are right now, so start now, right? I mean, if you say, you know, you put it off and you wait until you're 39, then you're gonna be like, shit, I mean, I wish I had a started back when I was 29, right? So don't, age is just a number. Like, don't use that as an excuse to, to not do anything. Like, start now. Start now. You'll never be as young as you are right now, so just jump in and do it, and that's the best decision you'll be able to make. I mean, you'll be, you'll be happy. I mean, you have a, hopefully, you have a long life ahead of you. I mean, potentially, you may have 70 years of life ahead of you. Why are you going to throw that 70 years away and live in a subpar, you know, life of, of not being healthy and active, right? I mean, start now.
and, and you know maximize your health and fitness for your later years. Okay, what else have we got? Uh, all right, we have a question here saying, I took your advice on filling myself up on healthier food, but how can I deal with caffeine and sugar withdrawal? Okay, good one. Um, first off, when it comes to caffeine, you can actually use that in moderation. So uh, I, I talked about this a while back. In fact, I did a, a personal caffeine detox um, a while back where I went 30 days with no caffeine whatsoever. And the reason I did that is because I felt I was abusing it. I was using it too much, too much coffee, uh, you know, too much pre-workouts and things like that. So sometimes you actually do need to go through a little detox if you are abusing it. But if you're using it within moderation, and when I say moderation, maybe three to 400 milligrams total per day. And ideally that would be in the earlier part of the day. No caffeine within the last six, seven hours before bedtime. So if you're having caffeine in the early part of the day and you're using it in moderation, that can actually be beneficial, right? So, I mean, it can help with uh, improving your workout performance. It can help with curbing your appetite, boosting your energy uh, in moderation. There are some health and metabolic benefits to caffeine. Uh, so again, use it, don't abuse it. As far as sugar is concerned, uh, you can swap out different sources for sugar. So instead of the processed sugars, you can eat more natural sugars. Fruit is a great one. I mean, uh, fruit is kind of like this. A lot of people have mixed reviews on fruit, but I think in moderation, fruit is really good. I mean, it's a great source of carbohydrates. There's a lot of vitamins. There's a lot of minerals, fiber. I mean, it's a very nutrient-dense food. It's very tasty and satisfying. I and mean, if you're looking for a healthy uh, sweet snack, fruit, you know, apples, bananas, pears, oranges, you know, grapes, berries, whatever. I mean, it's, it's great for that. And it can help you to control uh, the, the, the sweet cravings you have. So in, in my own case, I don't eat a lot of sweets, like in terms of processed sweets, but I will have some fruit in moderation. Like I'll eat, you know, maybe a couple bananas a day, maybe an apple a day. Uh, I like to have berries like frozen berries mixed up in like blender smoothies it's one of my favorite treats especially in the summertime i mean you can, I, i've got videos on youtube showing this where i mix up um like liquid egg whites protein powder and frozen berries blended up in the blender and you can make it nice and thick and it's almost like a a, a frozen yogurt ice cream type texture so i mean this can be a, a food that you eat to help satisfy those uh, sweet cravings you have but you're not filling it up with processed junk. You're actually getting high nutrient dense foods. So you're getting quality nutrients and antioxidants from the fruit and the berries. Uh, you're also getting, you know, good quality protein from the protein powder. So you can just make better food choices and get those sugar cravings uh, satisfied in a more natural, healthy way. Again, if you want some help with this, you know, planning out a meal plan for yourself, again, email me, right? Lee H at Lee Hayward.com. And I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, have a chat with you. We can kind of like do an overview of your current diet and, you know, suggest some areas where you can improve. All right, moving on. Let's see what else we've got. Um, all right, Jesse's joining us from Texas. He says he's been following my advice since he discovered me, and he says it's made his life a whole lot easier. Thanks for what you do. Well, thank you for your feedback, Jesse. I'm glad you appreciate my videos and content. And keep it up. Okay, what else we've got? Okay, Carnage Maximum says, how do you start working out after getting sick and what should a diet look like while you are sick or have a cold? All right, I can relate to this because just over the past week, I actually had a, you know, sore throat, snotty nose, you know, a, a cold more or less. And I, I think where I got it from is my son is going to daycare. And any of you who have young kids and they're going to daycare, you know, like at daycare, it's just, it, it's just a breeding ground for people getting sick, right? Because I mean, the kids are coughing and they got snotty noses. And of course, 
they're, they're playing and touching stuff and coughing. Like, you know, kids are not covering their cough when they, you know, cough or sneeze or whatever. And then they're touching and playing with the same toys. So, I mean, it's a breeding ground for people to get sick. And, of course, my son got sick. Then he's coming home. And, you know, he's coughing and everything else. So, obviously, my wife and I got sick as well. So, I can, I can relate to that. I've, you know, it, it does help strengthen the immune system over the long term. But, you know, while you are, you know, suffering through it, it, it sucks. What I recommend is, first off, scale back on the intensity of your workouts. Or, for that matter, you might even want to take a few days off the gym entirely. But what I do like to do is still get outside and go for a walk and do some cardio. Uh, getting outside, getting that fresh air in your lungs, just moving your body helps to circulate, you know, all, all the metabolic processes in your body. Breathing in that fresh air helps to naturally, you know, decongest your, your sinuses and stuff. I mean, when you're out walking in that, you know, sometimes you, you, your nose will just naturally want to clear, you know, you can blow the boogers out and stuff like that and feel that much more. It's almost like a temporary relief. So I do recommend daily walking, maybe even, you know, Instead of one big walk a day, maybe even do like two or three small walks throughout the day. Outside preferably so you can get that fresh air and help clear out the sinuses and make you feel better. Uh, as far as your diet, it really doesn't have to change that much. I mean, you still want to be eating nutrient-dense foods, drinking lots of fluids, uh, some things that can't help. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> one that I'm a big fan of for, for just nat like a natural decongestant. Uh, apple cider vinegar and lemon water. I like to drink that. I mean, I drink it anyway, but especially if you're feeling a bit under the weather, because it does help to get the, the cobwebs off your throat if, and, and it help aid with the, easing up the congestion that you might have in your sinuses and stuff. So that's a good drink to have. Um, really focus on uh, getting as much nutrient-dense food as you can. So Green, if you're taking green supplements, bump up the dosage of greens. Uh, you know, try and get more natural fruits and veggies in there. Uh, sometimes even in moderation, coffee and tea can help because a little bit of that caffeine helps as well when you're sick. It makes you feel better. It gives you a bit more of an energy pick-me-up, and it does have that, like, a natural decongestant as well. But your diet really doesn't have to change when you're sick. Now, sometimes you may feel your appetite. Sometimes it goes down. Sometimes it actually increases. But... Try and keep it nice, clean, healthy food. Don't use being sick as an excuse to eat junk food because if you're loading yourself up with processed junk food, then that's just going to delay the recovery process. So try and keep it as clean and healthy as possible. All right, don't, don't go seeking out comfort foods while you're sick because those processed comfort foods are just going to slow down the recovery. All right, let's move on. Samir is joining us and he says, cardio before or after a workout, both and how I would recommend it. A short cardio session at first as a warm up, maybe 10 minutes at the beginning of your workout just to get your core temperature elevated, circulate blood flow and prepare your body for some physical activity, some intense physical activity through weight training. But if you're going to do an extended cardio workout for fat burning, do it after the weight training and the reason for that is because you want to save your strength for the weight training workout. When it comes to weight training and cardio, it, like weight training should take priority over cardio, ideally, in terms of uh, building muscle, burning fat, and physical uh, like physique com composition. You know, building muscle, burning fat, weight training is priority. But you can still supplement it with cardio to get that fat burning and metabolic benefits as well. So do the cardio afterwards. You'll still get all the cardio benefits in terms of burning fat, but it's not going to take away the strength from your weight training. Versus if you did like a half hour or 45 minutes of cardio and then did weight training, you would probably be you know too tired to give it 100% intensity for your weight training workouts. So you just want to prioritize your energy so that you focus on what's most important. All righty, Rick is joining us. Uh, says, says I'm five foot nine. I weigh three hundred and thirty pounds. I've been in the gym for the past two months. I've noticed my chest, shoulders, and arms are starting to develop nicely, but I guess his question got cut off. Just a second, now. let's see if I can find where he picked it back up. But, um. And find where your question left off, Rick. Hang on now. <laughs> uh, can't 
find where Rick's question picked up. All right. Rick, if you are tuned in live right now, um, feel free to repost your question because I can't see where you uh, you continued it on. So again, if you're here, repost your question, what it is that you were asking, and I'll do my best. All right, let's see what else we got. Natalie is joining us. She says, I'm new to the live video chats. I usually watch the replays afterwards, so it's nice to be here while it's live. Well, thanks, Natalie. Glad that you could make it. And uh, there's, there's, there's something different about attending a live chat versus watching the replays. You know, the... When, because I'm following different people, you know, different coaches and stuff, and they do offer similar type of things. You know, they offer live webinars or live video chats and things like that. And if I can't make it live, I do catch the replay. But it, it just feels different. It's like when you're there live and taking it in, it's it's like you're you're more in the moment, you're more present, you're you're more attuned, and you actually pay better attention. But when it's the replay, it's like you know it's a pre-recorded video and it doesn't have the same oomph. You know, I guess you just don't take it in to the same degree. So again, I'm, I'm glad you can make it here live. All right, let's see what else we've got. All right, Ali is joining us. He says, please, how do you build wide shoulders? All right, wide shoulders. First off, the width of your shoulders, a lot of it is going to be determined by your natural genetic bone structure. Like some people are just broader naturally. You know, they have big, broad shoulders, and if if that is you, then congratulations, right? You know, that's something you can't physically change your bone structure, but you can change uh, how your muscles are developed. So if you are not gifted with big, broad shoulders, or even if you are, you can still maximize your shoulder with uh, primarily by focusing on building up the side head of the deltoids. So a lot of work for side head, meaning lateral raises, uh, that can definitely help. There's different lateral raise variations. And also just building more mass in the whole shoulder complex in general. So uh, I'll give you like a, a rule of thumb that you should focus on when you're training your shoulders. There are three heads to the shoulders. So you have the front head, the side head, and the rear head of the delts. So you want to do some isolation work for all three heads. Now, the thing you're going to find is when you do a lot of pressing exercises, so you're doing bench presses, you're doing overhead shoulder presses, that's going to primarily work a lot of the front head of the delt. Uh, it's also going to bring in the side and the rear to a certain degree, but primarily the front head. So you won't need to do as much isolation work for your front delts as you do for your side and your rear delts. So just keep that in mind, but you still want to do some nonetheless. Uh, so what I usually start to do when I'm training shoulders is I'll start off with some mobility exercises just to help warm up the whole shoulder complex. And I actually recommend this prior to any workout, you know, if any upper body workout or even lower body for that matter, you can still do shoulder mobility because the shoulders, they're a very fragile area because of the mobility that you have in your shoulders. You know, this whole 360 degree mobility, uh, it, it's it's very flexible and mobile, but at the same time, the joints, tendons, and ligaments surrounding the shoulders can be fragile, and they're prone to injury, especially when you're pushing maximum weight in the gym. So you want to be very careful with your shoulders. Warm them up before every training session just to help keep them healthy. Uh, then when you actually get into doing some shoulder work, I recommend starting off with some sort of shoulder press. Now, if you're new, you can use a machine shoulder press because that's going to be the easiest to learn, easiest to master, and um, it's it's more friendly because when it comes to a machine exercise, usually you can press directly in line with, with your head. Like if you look at most shoulder press machines at the gym, it's all perfectly in line. Whereas if you're doing a barbell press, you have to either press to the front or to the back of the head. And I'm not a big fan of, of pressing behind the head. Uh, for most people, because it, it usually just places a lot of excess strain on that shoulder due to the mobility of having to press behind the head. But I would recommend either machines for beginners. Uh, another good variation is overhead dumbbell presses. And then the overhead barbell press would be a more advanced variation. Still a great exercise, but you know, if, if you're new, start with machines and dumbbells first. Then I would recommend doing some isolation work. So some side lateral raises, or if you have access to these side lateral machines at your gym, you can use those as well. I actually really like the side lateral raise machine 
uh, the one where you're sitting down, it's a weight stack machine, and you're doing like a, a side lateral raise in this fashion. That allows you to lift a lot of weight and keep your form strict and keeps constant tension on the side delts at all times. So I'm a big fan of that one. It's a really good mass builder for the side delts. And you'd want to do a lot of work for the rear delts. So things where you're doing like a reverse fly, uh, you know, it could be a band pull apart. It could be face pulls. Uh, it could be like if you have access to a pec deck machine where you can do reverse pec deck flies. It's another great one for the rear delts. But do a lot of work for the rear delts because they are typically the most neglected area of the shoulders. So you want to really focus on building up the rear delts to keep everything in balance and proportion. And also helps to stabilize the shoulder and just add more mass all around. So those are the critical ones. And then as a finisher, you can do some isolation work for the front delts. Be that like a front raise, whether that's a dumbbell raise, barbell raise, plate raise, but some sort of front raise. Now, if you would like to see samples of this, just head to my main YouTube channel and open up the playlist tab that's there in the top menu bar. And there's this videos playlist there for shoulder workouts. So you can go check it out. I've got a whole bunch of shoulder workouts actually demonstrating the exercises that I was just talking about here. But uh, yeah, so that's a, an overview of how to build wider shoulders. All right, let's move on. Let's see what else we got. All right, uh, Moses is joining us. He says, happy Friday, Lee. I got a question regarding the chest. He says, I feel tight pressure in my sternum when I do heavy chest or certain exercises. What could be the cause? How can I adjust to this? Thanks. Tight pressure in your sternum when you're doing chest, heavy chest exercises. Hmm. I really would need no more context on that. I mean, is this something that's just recent? Is this something that's been going on for a while? Uh, you know, are you warming up prior to doing those heavy exercises? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different variables that we can play with here. But just based on that information alone, uh, what I would suggest is start off with some really good stretching and mobility work first uh, to help limber up your whole upper body. And if you want, you can actually do a search for uh, Lee Hayward warm-up on YouTube, and you'll see some warm-up videos that I have. I have several different warm-ups, and a lot of them do include exercises to help stretch out the shoulder, stretch out the chest, you know, different arm circle variations and things like that to help warm up that whole area. And of course, whenever you're doing exercises, always start off light and do several progressively heavier warm-up sets to build yourself up gradually. And what I would recommend in your case, uh, do your light warm-up set. So let's just say it's the bench press that's causing you trouble with the, the, your feeling that tightness. Maybe if when you do a warm-up set, you don't feel any tension or tightness, and then you do a progressively heavier warm-up set, still feels good, you increase the weight, next set, feels good. Once it gets to the point where you're actually starting to feel the pain, that's when I would kind of like, okay, let's let's stop. You know, use that as your threshold and, you know, maybe try different chest exercise variations, maybe like pec deck, dumbbell flies, push-ups. You could even try dips, whatever type of chest press machines you may have at your gym, but experiment with different variations and see if you can work your chest without getting that tension that you're feeling. And if, if not, then just try and do some different exercises with sub maximal weights to work around it. And usually over time, you will be able to build up your work capacity and your strength so that you can, you know, get past it. But uh, if, if, if it continues on, it'd probably be best to get it checked out by your doctor. And if, if there's something that you may have done, like maybe you pulled or strained something, then that, that's another can of worms entirely because you definitely want to get that checked out because if, if there's some sort of tear or, or, or you know, any type of strain there, you might want to get it checked out to make sure that you're not causing yourself further damage. But, you know, in order to really truly diagnose or offer some suggestions, I need to know more context about this one. All right, let's move on. Let's see what else we got. Um, okay, Lee, I've got a big question about diet. How do I avoid binge eating and how to resist fast foods and how to fix emotional eating, like eating when happy or eating when stressed? All right, that's that's not about you know counting calories, counting macros, or anything else. That is, like you said, that's emotional. That's that's mental issues. That comes down to your eating habits, and that's a 
that's deep, right? That that's beyond just like you know, here here's your diet plan written out on paper, go follow it. I mean, you know what you should be eating, it's just you can't follow it due to you know various emotional or lack of discipline or whatever it happens to be. What I'd recommend you do, send me an email and we can chat about this offline in private and see if we can come up with a strategy or, or hopefully uncover some of these root issues that are causing you to suffer with emotional eating, binge eating, all that. That's, you know, that that's uh, beyond the scope of this video chat, right? I mean, that's that's emotional issues that, you know, you probably don't want to be discussing for the whole world to, to listen about right here. But if you would like some help with it, send me an email. Again, my email is leeh at leehayward.com, and I'd be more than happy to chat about it with you in private. All right, let's move on. First Revenge is joining us, and he says, Lee, do you believe in a stronger back for a bigger bench press? Yeah, I, I do, and that, that applies not just for a bench press, but applies for all your body parts. You need to train the agonist and antagonist, you know, so both the opposing muscles. So if, if you want a stronger press, you need to have a stronger back for that base. Um, that applies for all your muscles, right? You need to work both sides, the agonist and antagonist or the opposing muscle groups. So yeah, you will notice a big difference with that. Okay, another question. Uh, Tushar, I think it is, Tushar, says, what do you think of a push-pull split? I'm a big fan of push-pull split, and that kind of core relates to the question I just answered of working opposing muscle groups. When you're doing your pushing exercises one day and you're pulling exercises the next, you are training those opposing muscle groups. And I find when you do push-pull, uh, some people like to break it up into push-pull legs, which is fine as well, you're working similar movement patterns in the same training session so that it actually aids with recovery because you're working all those similar movement patterns in one session and then in the next session you're working the opposing movement patterns and it just allows more recovery time uh, without a lot of carryover. I mean, for ex again, there's pros and cons to all of it. So don't think like one program is superior to another because, you know, you, you can look at it and break it down and say there's pros and cons to all of it. But some of the advantages of a push-pull split is to group together these similar movement patterns. For example, like if you train back one day and then you train biceps the next, well, you're, you're training both uh, the same movement patterns because the biceps come in as secondary muscles when you're doing your back exercises. So if you pair them up together in a pull workout, you, you train them at the same time and then you also get equal recovery time for those muscle groups. So it's, it's definitely a good one. And if, if you want, uh, in my playlists on the main YouTube channel, there are some sample um, push-pull workouts, and there's also push-pull leg workouts in there as well. Uh, Jesse's asking, when should someone look into HGH supplements? That would be human growth hormone supplements, or are they a waste? A, a lot of... The supplements, meaning the, the nutritional supplements that you get, like at GNC or any of these, you know, supplement stores, you know, they may help to a certain degree, but they're they're not the same thing as actual human growth hormone or, or anything like that. And even when you look at um, human growth hormone as the actual hormone itself, you know. It's, it's kind of one of those overrated, overpriced, you know, supplements to begin with, right? So uh, as far as when should somebody look into that, I mean, if, if you had some blood work from your doctor and you had low, you know, HDH levels, then okay, yeah, you could definitely look into it then, you know, probably look into a hormone replacement therapy or something along those lines, or you could try the, the natural route with, with supplements, but Generally speaking, this is something that people who are 40, 50, 60 plus are going to have more of an issue with versus people who are younger. So if if you're in your teens, 20s, or even in your 30s, I wouldn't even bother with it. I'd only, you know, for people who are, you know, in that second half of life, something you might want to get checked out. And I mean, you could always start with uh, blood work from your doctor to see if you actually are deficient in it or not. So that that's when I would recommend it or recommend looking into it, as you asked. 
Okay, next question here. Uh, this one's from First Revenge. He says, how did your body respond when you quit powerlifting and went back into bodybuilding? Did your strength drop significantly? I've been training for five years now, and I'm considering transitioning. Yeah, you, you when you switch from one or the other, you, you will notice a change. And a lot of it isn't so much, well... We really need to zoom out and look at the big picture because you can still train heavy in a bodybuilding fashion, right? I mean, you look at a, a lot of bodybuilders. Some of them train very heavy. Some of them have powerlifting backgrounds. Like if you look at oh, former Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman, I mean, even when he was bodybuilding, he was still pushing heavy weights like a powerlifter in a lot of the, you know, the, the power lifts, right? Heavy Heavy bench presses, heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, right? I mean, you know, you look at some of these videos there. What was it? He had the 800-pound squat like five weeks out from the Olympia, whatever. R just ridiculous numbers, right? So, I mean, he was still training heavy while bodybuilding. And some guys do that. Some guys still train very heavy while bodybuilding. You know, so you can kind of do both. Uh, but then you have some people who purposely train lighter and – it really depends on a lot of things. Sometimes they're training lighter because they find that their body actually responds better to lighter weights, more time under tension, uh, or sometimes it's working around injuries. And, and more often than not, especially as people get older, they probably transition into lighter lifting because they're working around injuries. And, you know, that's that's more or less where, where I've transitioned to because my body just can't stand the 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 strain and the stress of, of the heavy lifting like it used to. I find that if I push myself really hard and heavy, my risk of injury goes way up. And at this stage, I, adding an extra 50 pounds to my bench press isn't worth the risk of tearing my pec or blowing out a, a rotator cuff or something like that. So I'm more conservative because I'm in this for health and longevity and, and because I actually enjoy working out. It makes me feel good rather than simply chasing numbers. And everybody that I know personally who has pushed themselves with powerlifting, everybody sooner or later gets beat up. You know, muscle tears, uh, just joint problems, whatever. I mean, I, I've seen it all from, from knee replacements, hip replacements, you know, pec tears, bicep tears, you name it. So I've seen a lot of injuries through powerlifting. Now, there's a lot of injuries through bodybuilding as well, but... Uh, I think powerlifting probably even has more injuries than, than bodybuilding because, again, the whole goal of it is just simply powering up the weights. But, yeah, if you transition from one or the other, uh, you will notice your strength drop because you're just not training the same. You know, the, the, the mentality of a bodybuilding workout is totally different than the mentality of a powerlifting workout. Right? A powerlifter is there to use their muscles to move the weight. And the bodybuilder is there to use the weights to build the muscle. So even though both are lifting weights, you're using them totally differently and, and you're going to get a different response. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, how many, sorry, after how many years of training do we stop seeing gains? Um, I mean, you can still make progress for the long term, but you're not going to see the same gains in terms of like sheer mass gains once you get past a certain stage. Like usually it's it's within the first five years or so where people are going to maximize their progress. Now, it, it really depends on a lot of variables because there's really not like a one size fits all cookie cutter answer to this because, you know, if, if you've been working out for several years, but you've been on and off, or, or like a lot of people, you're more off than on, then if you just get consistent, then you can see, you know, some consistent gains just from that alone. But for people who are, let's assume that you have someone who starts off training from day one and they are consistent, following a proper program and really pushing themselves and doing everything right, working with a coach and maximizing their training, their nutrition and everything else right from day one. And there's no off time, none of this on and off crap, you know, because, I mean, whatever gains you make while you're on, you're going to lose when you're off. So a lot of times when you hear people say, oh, I've been working out on and off for 10 years, 
they've just been gaining and losing the same muscle for 10 years, right? So they're not really moving forward. But if you have someone who's consistent right from the start, uh, generally speaking, this is how it's going to work. You're going to make your best gains in your first year of good, solid, consistent training. In your second year, you're probably going to get about half of the gains that you made in your first year. In your th third year, you're probably going to get about half the gains that you made in your second year. And then each year thereafter, you're probably going to do about half as well as you did the previous year. So eventually it's going to get to the point where, you know, if just making any progress at all, like after you've been training for like five or 10 years, if you're making any progress at all at that stage, that's good progress. You know, and a lot of times it's almost like you're just training to maintain once you get beyond that phase. Now, of course, if somebody adds in performance enhancing drugs and things like that, then that, that changes the game entirely because now you're, you're, you're adding muscle artificially and that's you know topic for another discussion. But for a natural lifter, natural bodybuilder, that's the way it's going to work. Your best gains are year one, 50% of that year two, 50% of that year three, and then each year you're going to get less and less. All right, so next one, Anthony's joining us, and he says, your thoughts on smoking weed to help with calorie intake. I've never been a weed smoker, right? I've I've never smoked it when it was illegal. I don't smoke it now that it's legal. That's here in Canada, marijuana is legal, and I have no desire to use it. I haven't used it, so I really, I'm not the man to talk about or talk to when it comes to uh, weed. What do you think of Athlean X, Jeff Cavalier? I'm a huge fan of Jeff. Oh, thank you so much. Look at this. My beautiful wife has given me a hot beverage. Mm. Very good. Very good. It's a cup of green tea, in case you're wondering. Green tea. Mm. had a bit of a dry throat there. Like I mentioned earlier in the chat, I did have a bit of a scratchy throat and cough this week, so I can feel it when I'm talking nonstop. I can feel my throat acting up. So that uh, green tea is soothing it right now. Anyway, back to the question. This one's from Tushar saying, what do you think of Athlean X? First off, I have huge respect for Athlean X because he started after I did on YouTube and he has just exploded. I don't know how many millions of subscribers the man has right now, but it is it is up there. I think it's like seven million or something. I whatever, but um, he he has a lot of good content, very detailed. I mean, if if you have questions about injuries or mobility issues or whatever. Uh, I, I like Jeff's videos because he really goes into details and he brings out his skeleton dummy thing to really show you, okay, this is where those joints and ligaments attach and this is the reason why you're having that problem and stuff. I mean, so he's very, very brilliant when it comes to stuff like that. And, and I do respect what he's doing. I mean, he puts out a ton of good quality content. Uh, for the most part, I have to agree with a lot of the stuff he, he puts out. Now, of course, there are some things that I, I don't agree with. And, and that, that's, that's cool with everybody. I mean, you don't have to agree with everything anybody says in order to like and respect them. And that applies with me. I mean, you guys watching my videos right now, I mean, there's probably certain things that I'm saying or recommending. And you're like, you know what, Lee, that, that I don't really agree with that. I've tried something else and, you know, I find that the opposite approach works. And if, if that's the case, then that's cool, right? You know, you don't always have to, uh, to agree with everything somebody says. But uh, overall, I do find uh, I have a lot of agreements with what Jeff puts out and uh, I, I do watch his videos from time to time I mean I'm I don't watch every video he pumps out but I do watch a lot of them and uh, again good stuff I, I've never met him in person but he was one of the top 16 trainers chosen by YouTube back in 2011 for those of you who've been following me for a while you may recall back in 2011 uh, YouTube chose, they had this program called the Next Trainer Program, and they chose 16 people in the fitness space and different categories of fitness, you know, like some were in yoga, some were, you know, um, in, in different areas of like female fitness, male fitness, some were in bodybuilding and sports and, and all that stuff. Uh, Jeff was one of those 16 trainers. I was another one of those 16 trainers. 
and at the time i think my channel was actually uh, we might have been on, on par with about the same number of subscribers and everything else back then in 2011 and since then like jeff is just like, like you know it just went off the chart so again i have huge respect for what the man has accomplished and he's pumped out a lot of quality videos all right let's see what else we got um Mac is joining us. He says, I'd like to know exercise split to make muscle faster. I would like to know exercise split to make muscle faster. Okay. I guess you're asking for the best split routine. And honestly, there is no best. Uh, it, it really depends on the individual and how you're, you're the stage you're at in your training and everything else. And even then, when you get to a certain level, it, it can change. And I'll give you a prime example. Um, like right now, we have the, the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle, and we have a new workout program every month. For those of you, I know se several people who are on this video chat are actually members of the Inner Circle. Uh, but the way it works is you could follow a set program, you know, whatever it is. Let's just say it's a total body workout, right? You follow that for know a month or six weeks or whatever and you're gonna make some progress with that program right but eventually your progress is gonna slow down and you're gonna hit a plateau every program you follow goes through you know a phase where you adapt to that program you grow in response to that program and then eventually you hit a plateau with that program once you hit that plateau then you need to change something up now it could be changing up the exercises it could be changing up the sets and reps uh, it could be changing up the tempo or, or whatever, but you could also change up the split. So, I mean, you could just train, change up the way that you work your body parts. But when you introduce change, you provide unique muscle stimulation and you start the whole process again. So now you're going to adapt to this new program. You're going to grow in response to this new program. And eventually you're going to plateau with that new program. And then you need to change it up again. And this is kind of like an ongoing process. You know, you're, you're constantly going to be going through this to some degree or another. Now, some people can stick to a certain split or a certain workout program longer than others. Uh, some are going to adapt quicker. Uh, generally speaking, the more advanced you are, the faster you are going to adapt to a set program. The more, the, the, the newer you are, uh, the, the longer it's going to take to adapt because you, you have, your body is not as in tune to the exercises. You know, you're not as in tune with working your body. So you have, the, it takes longer to really max out a program when you're new. So, for example, you could take a novice and they might stick to the same program for three or four months and make solid progress with that same program, whereas an advanced person might only get six weeks and then they need to change it up. But as far as how I would split up programs for people, if, if somebody came to me, like let's just say we have a... You know, a generic Joe Blow walks into the gym and he says, Lee Hayward, I want you to be my coach and train me. What would you do? Uh, I would probably have Joe Blow start off with a beginner's total body workout three days a week. You know, just get him used to going to the gym, get him used to doing some basic exercises and just, a, just develop the habit of going to the gym consistently, right? And also providing some unique muscle stimulation. So, I mean, boom, three total body workouts a week. Once he's plateaued with that, then I would probably split it up and let's do now an upper lower body split, right? So we'd have him do that until he plateaued with that program. Then after that, I might split it up and say like do push pull legs until he eventually plateaued with that. And then we might get into some more advanced, you know, bodybuilding split routine where he can isolate the muscle groups more, include more exercise variety. And then if he plateaued with that, we might even go back to the basics again. We might do more... Uh, a total body program, but do a more advanced version of total body training and kind of go through those those phases again. So that's kind of like the, the structure of our, our workout of the month program on the inner circle. I mean, we will go through different training modalities, but each one is complementary to the previous month's program. And that's the whole idea of it is to keep your body progressing. Because if you keep doing the same thing over and over, especially after you've hit a plateau, I mean, yeah, you may make some progress, but it's the slow way to make progress. The fastest way to make progress is once you know you've hit a plateau, is to change the, the training stimulation, change the exercises, change the set and rep pattern, change the, the split routine that you're doing. And by doing that, you provide 
the you know totally unique muscle stimulation and you can help start that process all over again and another benefit of that is it just keeps your workouts fun and, and exciting i mean your training gains are directly correlated to your enthusiasm as well i mean if you get to the point where you're bored with your workouts and you just like you're going to the gym and you're like oh i hate this i'm doing the same old crap day in day out and it's just boring I mean, your enthusiasm starts to drop, and when your enthusiasm drops, you know, your level of intensity and dedication, that all, it all correlates. So, I mean, that starts to dwindle as well, and eventually you're just kind of going through the motions, you know, dragging your ass. It's almost like going to work, right? Oh, Monday morning again. I got to drag my ass to the office and do the same old crap, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if that's the way you feel about your job, then, you know, you're probably not going to be progressing very fast with your job, right? You have to love what you're doing, right? It has to be fun. It has to be enjoyable. Same applies with your workouts. So if you can keep your workouts fun and enjoyable, then you're going to be making progress much faster than if you're doing the same thing over and over again and you're just dreading the process. So that's why I like to change up uh, workouts. But I caution you, don't change them up too quickly. You know, this is one of the drawbacks because some people think, well, if change is good, then I'll just change it up all the time. So this week I'll do one workout. Next week I'll do another workout. Following week I'm going to do something totally different. And you're just... You don't know what the heck you're doing from day to day because you're just doing something totally different. I mean, that's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, anything is better than nothing, but it's hard to monitor and actually make progress that way because how are you basing your progress? I mean, if you're doing something different all the time, you, you can't track that in terms of measurable progress. So in order to really maximize your gains, you need to stick to the same program and go through that adapt, grow, and plateau and and that usually takes a minimum of six weeks for most people, right? Six weeks, and then you can actually move on to something else and make some noticeable progress in the, in the process. All right, let us move on. Ike is joining us, and he says he's 47 years old, and he wants to know how he can build his legs at the gym. Well, that's the best place to build them because you have access to a lot of different exercises. I mean, squats, leg presses, leg extensions, lunges, step ups, leg curls, stiff leg deadlifts, calf raises, standing and seated. I mean, you know, adductor, abductor. I mean, there's so many leg exercises you have available at the gym. I'm not, if, if you want some sample leg workouts, rather than me trying to, you know, regurgitate them all here. Head on over to my main channel page and open up the playlist tab and you will see playlists there for leg workouts. And even within some of the other workout programs, every training series that I have in there will be some leg workouts. So for example, if you open up the positions of flexion vid playlist, there's going to be a leg workout using positions of flexion. If you have like the upper lower body split, obviously there's going to be lower body workouts in there for the legs. Um, whatever, you know, program or, or, or playlist that you open up in there, there's going to be leg workouts in there. So you can definitely follow along with those. Uh, if, if you're brand new, um, which I would assume you probably are, if you're asking how do you build your legs at the gym, that's kind of a, a, a newbie question. Nothing wrong with that, you know, just stating the obvious here. Uh, I would probably recommend just start off with a basic beginner's total body workout. Just focus on that for now. And again, I have a basic beginner's total body workout right on my main channel page that you can follow. So you can start with that. And from there, as you go through that adapt, grow, plateau phase, then we can progress on to more advanced programs as your body needs those more advanced programs. All right, so in this one, Justin is saying, I skipped his question. Sorry about that, Justin. Let me see, it's, I think it's just inform you. I guess your name is Justin, I don't know. Let me scroll down and see, Let's do a search for it. Um, the only question I'm getting from you, Justin, is saying you skipped over my question. <laughs> Literally, I just typed in your name in the chat, and that's all that's coming up here. That's weird. If your question didn't get posted, uh, post it again. Go ahead, post it now. I'm still here. You know, if, if you have a question, post it at the end, and I'll do my best to answer it. But um, I just did a search, Justin, and then your question did not pop up, so... Maybe it didn't get posted properly. All right, next one here. This one's from 
Tushar again. He says, I do judo. One time I landed terribly in training. At first, the pain was unbearable. After five months, the pain stopped, but it comes and goes. For example, when I do heavy squats, it hurts. What do I do? Stop judo. <laughs> uh, I, I was involved with martial arts for, for several years, and most recently, well, I mean, recently for me, I mean, it was... Uh, uh, I was doing some Brazilian jiu-jitsu and the reason why I stopped doing that is because I had some injuries and I just decided, you know, it's not worth it. I'm getting beat up doing this stuff and, you know, I, I have no dreams of, of becoming a, you know, an MMA fighter or getting in the ring or any of that. I just was doing it for for a change, for fun, right? But I was getting beat up and the, the straw that broke the camel's back was we were doing takedowns, kind of similar to judo takedowns. And uh, I landed on my knee, and the way that I landed, it just, man, it messed up my, my knee big time. And I was for months dealing with a knee injury. I mean, I, I couldn't squat properly. I couldn't really do anything with, without causing pain. And how I rehabbed that was every time I went to the gym, I didn't do any uh, normal leg workouts. Like, I didn't do squats or leg presses, but as part of my warm-up routine, Every single time I did a hundred leg extensions, just use very lightweight. I put, you know, maybe 20, 30 pounds on the weight stack, whatever it was, very light. And I just do a hundred total reps. So I did them in a rest pause fashion. So I might, you know, bang out 20, 30 reps, rest 10 seconds, bang out another, you know, 10, 20 reps, rest uh, 15 seconds, and just keep doing them in a rest pause fashion like that with little mini rest breaks until I banged out a hundred total reps. And I did that every single workout for weeks, and it really helped to rehab my knee because the constant movement, the constant blood flow, and just that light stimulation and, and the repetitions really helped to rebuild the cartilage and the knee joint. So that was what helped to rehab my knee pain. So if what you're experiencing is knee pain, which I kind of think it might be, you didn't specify knee, but you're saying that when you do heavy squats, it hurts. So... That's something you might want to do. Obviously, lay off the heavy squats. You know, anything that hurts, don't do it. Find another exercise variation to do instead. But the the frequent uh, high repetition leg extensions is a great one for rehab and knee injuries. And also try and work around uh, your injury the best you can. So maybe you can't do squats, but you might be able to do like the inner and outer thigh machine. So you're working your hips. Um, you know, maybe you can do some step ups or or something like that. Maybe you can do some leg curls, right? Just just try and work around it the best you can. And when you do get back into squats, don't use a barbell. Just use body weight squats. See if you can do that, you know, and then gradually build it up. You know, maybe from body weight squats, do body weight squats, then eventually do goblet squats. And, you know, and try some of the different leg exercise machines that you have available at your gym and just gradually build yourself up. When you get to doing squats, just start with the empty barbell on your back. See if that feels fine. If it does, then build it up slowly. Slow, slow progression is the key to rehabbing an injury. You know, one of the problems I see is, is guys get injured and they might take some time off, which which is fine, but then they, they try and jump back into where they left off. So, like let's just say, you know, I'm just throwing some numbers out here, but let's say you're squat squatting 225 pounds. You hurt yourself and you say, Oh, I can't do squats anymore. So you lay off the squats for a while. And then when you get back into it again, you say, well, I'll try 225 again. And then you feel the pain or you might re-injure yourself, right? When you're starting off and coming back from an injury, start off light, like literally the empty barbell light, just go through the motions. And then if that feels good, then put like five pounds on each side and go through that, you know, put another five pounds on, go through that and build yourself up slowly, slowly, slowly until you're back up to your previous weight, and then uh, you should be able to progress from there without causing too much pain and aggravation. You know, what's, what often happens is people get a minor injury that sets them back, and then while they're trying to rehab that minor injury, they end up doing too much too soon and causing that minor injury to become a major injury. You know, it's the first injury just screws stuff up, but then while you're, you get too eager and you jump back too soon, you end up screwing things up even more and causing major damage. That's what often happens. So you need to be extra cautious in that recovery rehab phase so that you don't turn a minor injury into a major one. And uh, patience is the key. Realize that this this is not something that you're going to fix in, the, in, a, in a week or two. You know, sometimes this takes 
month, couple months. In some cases, it might take longer. I mean, when I was rehabbing that knee injury, I mean, I don't recall exactly how long it was, but it was it was a few months before I was back to normal. All right, let's see what else we've got. Um, okay, so let's see. John is joining us. He says, how long should you stick to your program before trying a new one? Is changing programs even required to continue growing or is progressive overload enough? I kind of covered that already with the whole adapt, grow, plateau rant that I was doing earlier. So I'm not going to re revisit that. Um, okay. Let's see what else we got. And this one's from Sean. He says, Lee, if forcing something to handle a huge load makes it grow, why isn't my girlfriend the size of King Kong? I'm, I don't know. <laughs> Next, I... <laughs> um, is creatine good for a teenager? Creatine is a natural substance that's found in food, and your body actually needs creatine. Uh, so, yeah, you can use creatine as a teenager. I started using creatine back in 1995 when I was 17 years old. So, yeah, you can definitely use creatine as a teenager. Uh, do some homework on creatine. Like a lot of people think creatine is bad. Like there's there's this connotation that if something has performance enhancing benefits, that it must be bad for you, right? Like people think, well, you know, protein helps build muscle. Protein must be bad. Creatine helps build muscle. Well, creatine must be bad. In fact, if if you do your homework, there's a numerous health benefits to it, and that's why it helps to build muscle. That's why it helps to increase energy. I mean, your body needs creatine, and, and so. Creatine actually has numerous health benefits. It's not a bad thing. And in fact, I would recommend people to take creatine even if you didn't work out, just for the health benefits alone. I mean, it has numerous benefits. I mean, from mental and cognitive function. I mean, it's great for, for people with, uh, you know, mental degenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and things like that. It can help to enhance brain function. There's so many benefits to, to creatine, not just from the, the strength point of view and the muscle building point of view. So, I mean, I, I take it every day just, just as a, you know, just same as I take my vitamins every day. S same idea. All right. This one is from a doctor who lifts. That's his username. He says, how many rest days should we take while training for strength? Generally, I recommend either every other day or at most two days on one day off. I find that you need adequate recovery in order to maximize your strength. And if you try and train too frequently, you're going to limit your recovery. And it's more than just muscle recovery here. It's recovery for your joints, your tendons, and your ligaments. A lot of people don't factor that in, but you may not have muscle soreness after a workout, or you may recover from muscle soreness, but sometimes your joints are not fully recovered. And this is especially important the older you get. Right? The older you get, the more wear and tear you have on your joints. Sometimes the longer it takes to recover. Uh, but it, it still applies for younger guys as well. So I've made my best strength gains training every other day or three days a week. Right? You know, Because having that full day of rest in between each workout allows your body to rest, recover, and grow so that you can feel uh, stronger when you do work out. If you try and work out too often, like this whole six-day-a-week thing, uh, you're kind of like just digging yourself in a rut because you're not giving your time, your body enough time to rest and recover between workouts before you're in there breaking it down again. So I find for maximum strength gains, either every other day, like day on, day off, or at most two days on, one day off. I wouldn't recommend going three or more days in a row unless, you know, your schedule absolutely required it. Uh, but ideally, you know, one day on, one day off. Uh, what's your take on full body training? Uh, we kind of covered that. All different training programs and splits have their time and place. And I'm a big fan of full body training. The best time to do full body training is if you're a beginner, just getting started. And it's also great for people who are on a very tight schedule or, or meaning that you don't have the flexibility to work out as often as you like. So if you can only hit the gym two or three days a week, 
you get more bang for your buck doing full body workouts than you would trying to do a body part split. Because let, let, let's say you're only in the gym, let's just twice a week, right? You've got a really busy schedule, whatever, and, and you can only make two workouts a week. Well, if you're doing full body workouts, then you're getting each body part hit once, hit twice a week. And you're still getting some decent frequency and, and muscle stimulation. Versus if you were doing a body part split, only hitting one major muscle group per workout, and you're only hitting the gym twice a week, it's going to take you two or three weeks just to train your entire body. So for people who are pressed for time, full body workouts are great. Uh, if you have the luxury and you enjoy working out more frequently, then that's where body part splits can really come into play. But from a, a progress point of view, I mean, you can make it all work depending on the other factors, you know, the rest, the recovery, the lifestyle, the nutrition, all that stuff uh, lays the foundation for the type of progress that you're going to make for the for, from the training split that you're following. So it's, again, it's it's just another, another method that you have, and again, they're it works depending on your schedule. Stuart's joining us. Stuart's saying key, and he says, is cardio important while trying to gain muscle? Uh, yeah, I believe cardio is important. It's great for active recovery. Cardio is also good for uh, leaner gains. You will make leaner gains. You will help to improve your, your uh, endurance and your recovery when you do it. So there's different ways of going about it. Like you can do cardio after your weight training workouts. You can do cardio on your off days. Uh, if you're trying to maximize strength and muscle gains, uh, a good schedule that you could follow would be to do weight training one day and cardio the next. Weight training one day, cardio the next, and just alternate them back and forth. I, I often refer to this as yin and yang training style because you're getting the high intensity weight training with one workout and then you're getting the low intensity cardio training with the next and alternating them back to back is a very complimentary way to get daily exercise so you're getting the metabolic benefits of daily exercise the health benefits but it's also complimentary for recovery and growth at the same time so it, it definitely plays a role you will feel better you'll recover better you'll be so much more healthier if you're doing regular cardio along with your weight training All right, let's see what else we've got. Uh, Pablo's joining us. UDU Seafull is joining us. He's happy to be here. He's off from work today. Good for you. Um, okay, let's see what else we got. I'm 18 years old. I like to lift heavy. What do you recommend? I mean, you, there's nothing wrong with lifting heavy as long as you're doing it with proper form and you are lifting within your means. Simply... Lifting like lifting heavy with crappy form is an injury waiting to happen. Lifting heavy with good controlled form uh, is, is what's required to build muscle. So it really comes down to maximizing your form. And I would err on the conservative side. Get your form nailed down. Uh, ideally, even get some help from an experienced coach, you know, especially if you're young and you're just getting started. Because um, not, not to pick on young people, but a lot of times you see young guys in the gym using sloppy form, training way too heavy, and they're getting away with it because they have youth on their side. You know, when you're young, your joints, tendons, and ligaments are mobile and they're supple and they can generally handle a lot of abuse, but over time, that's going to add up. I mean, when, when I'm using myself as an example, because when I was younger, my form was absolute garbage, right? I mean, I didn't know how to train. I was just doing it on my own. And I mean, when I look back at it now, I mean, the stuff that I used to do, I mean, I just cringe thinking about it, right? Just as a type of lifts and workouts that I did and stuff. I mean, it's, it's only a miracle that I wasn't more injured and beat up. But as you get older, your, your body isn't as forgiving as it once was. And, you know, you can't train with the same level of abuse. So what I'd recommend, especially if, if you like to lift heavy, get, it would be ideal to work with an experienced powerlifting coach who can actually teach you how to lift heavy and do so properly. Because the thing about powerlifting, technique is everything, right? I mean, if, if you do a, a heavy bench press, but you use crappy form, it's not going to pass in a competition, you know? So, I mean, it doesn't count. What's the point? Same with heavy squats. I mean, if you do heavy squats with poor form, it's not going to pass in a competition. So, what's the point? Same with deadlifts, all of them, right? You need to have proper form. So, 
master the form, master the technique, and then focus on the weight afterwards. And uh, that, that would be a, a good recommendation. I mean, anybody for that matter, especially if, if you're young and you're trying to maximize your, your strength, uh, work with an experienced powerlifting coach who can help teach you proper technique for all the different lifts. And I mean, that'll help lay the foundation, even if your ultimate goal is bodybuilding or just uh, general strength and conditioning, that will help lay a good foundation. I mean, some of the best bodybuilders started off as powerlifters and built their foundation through powerlifting. So, I mean, I definitely would recommend that. How are we doing for time, guys? Oh, we've gone over time as always, but uh, I'll answer a couple more questions and clue it up. Let's see any more questions we actually do have here. We don't have a whole lot. I see. I just scroll down. Wayward Worker says he's got to go. Have a great weekend. And you're welcome. And thanks for tuning in. Um, okay. Thoughts on full body training. A lot of these are repetitive questions. Um, okay. Let's see. I'm just going to answer a couple more and clue it up. This one's from Bono Po Bono Bo. Sorry, uh, do you think combat conditioning, which is calisthenics and a good full body weight weight training workout, is a good idea? Um, combat conditioning. I'm assuming you're probably referring to Matt Fury's program, Combat Conditioning. That's what's coming to mind when I hear the word combat conditioning. Uh, I, I followed Matt Fury. For years, I've actually got a whole bunch of his old DVD programs and stuff. Um, that's part of my my collection of uh, fitness stuff. <laughs> I mean, I've had so many programs and DVD programs and video programs and that over the years and books. I mean, I've got a quite a hefty library, but I've got maybe twenty or thirty of Matt Fury's DVDs down in my basement up there on the shelf. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he has the combat conditioning, you know, the Hindu squats, the Hindu push-ups, and the, the bridging and all that stuff. Uh, it, it's all good. I mean, and any form of exercise is, is, is good like that. I mean, it's definitely beneficial. Uh, you can use it to help build muscle, increase your work capacity and strength and all that. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, you can incorporate that with weight training. Uh, if you're stuck in a jam, you can do body weight only workouts as well. I mean, that, that does work, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's, bottom line, anything is better than nothing, right? But you really need to focus on, like, what is it that you want to ultimately focus on? You know, if your main goal is bodybuilding, then you definitely need to have that weight training component in there. Now, you can supplement it with, with body weight workouts or incorporate body weight workouts with your weight training workouts. That's fine. But like body weight alone is, is not going to really maximize your muscle to the full potential. You can still get in great shape. Don't get me wrong. But if you're looking at like bodybuilding or powerlifting in terms of maximizing your strength and maximizing your muscle mass, you need the weight training component in there as well. All right, next one, Blue Leaf is saying, Lee, just wondering your opinion on the reliability of protein supplements and how much protein they actually contain compared to what the labels tell you. Um, most reputable brands are going to be fairly close. I know there was a scandal a while back. You see, like a lot of the companies were saying they had X amount of protein, and then when they were tested by third-party companies, they didn't meet the label claims. Um you know, that, that's probably going to go on to a certain degree with, with a lot of food products. And for that matter, not just protein, but anything with a nutrition label, any food, those labels could be off by a good 25%. And it's not always the fault of the manufacturer. Sometimes it is, you know, when they, especially when they, they're, they're bending the nutrition label rules. Like, for example, if... Um, if you're looking at fat content, for example, uh, sometimes if it's less than a gram, they can round it down to zero. And they might make the serving size so ridiculously small that the per serving is less than a gram. So then they round it down to zero, even though there's no way this thing is fat free. Prime example of that is you look at like um, the, the cooking spray, like Pam cooking spray. They say on the can that it's fat free. 
yet the ingredients is oil, right? How is oil fat free? Like oil is 100% fat, but then they make the serving size so ridiculously small that it's less than a gram per serving, and then they are allowed to legally round it down to zero. So, I mean, there's all kinds of, of stupid manipulation tricks going on in the food label business. But even if they're not pulling those stupid tricks, there can be a variance of up to 25% on a nutrition label of what it, the label says and what you're actually getting. And it's not always the fault of the manufacturer. I mean, it could be due to a whole host of things that are, you know, for, for example, I'll give you just some simple examples that we can all relate to. Uh, look at bananas. If you take a green banana versus a yellow banana versus a banana that's starting to go bad and it's turning brown, if you look at the nutritional information of a banana in all those three phases, it's totally different. The green banana has way more starch, way less sugar. As it turns yellow, it's kind of in the middle, you know, an equal balance of starches and sugars. As it starts to turn brown, it's all those starches are breaking down and converting into sugars. So you can have totally different nutrition in the exact same food, the exact same portion size, but it's just depending on where it is in its phase of whether it's green, ripe, or starting to rot, and the nutrition and information and values can change drastically. You know, I mean, take grape juice, right? You take a, a grape juice by itself, or if you have it fermented into wine, it's the same grape juice, but the nutrition value can change totally depending on where it is, right? Along the, the phase of processing or, or whatever. So, so that applies to a lot of different foods, you know, when they were picked, how ripe they are. Uh, sometimes different batches can have higher or lower calories, especially if it's processed foods. So uh, just realize that a nutrition label, take it all with a grain of salt. And again, that applies with protein as well. Take it with a grain of salt. It's a, a, a general estimate of what's in the label, but it may not be 100% accurate. But, you know, it's probably fairly close. And... Generally speaking, the, the more reputable the companies, probably the closer it's going to be. Uh, where protein supplements really get shady is some, some places where they're making fake protein. Now, in North America, we, I don't think we really have a problem with fake protein. But I know in, in countries like India and, and some of these countries throughout the Middle East where supplements are not as readily available and, you know, they're actually more expensive, there's a lot of knockoffs. And that's actually a big thing. I wasn't aware of this until, you know, just a few years back when people were contacting me about fake protein powders and asking me about it. I'm like, what do you mean fake protein? I mean, who, who's going to fake a protein powder, right? Like in North America, nobody's going to bother doing that. But in, in some countries, especially throughout the Middle East and that, it, it's a big, big scam, right? You know, you're, you're getting just like, you know, you get knockoffs in, in anything. There's knockoffs in protein. So. You know, I think that's the biggest thing you need to look at when it comes to protein supplements. But anyway, in, in North America, anyway, a protein supplement is going to be fairly close to whatever it says on the label. All right, let's move on. Let's see what else. Okay, this one's from... Hyde Tora says, Lee, I listen to your advice and I've been consistent with my diet and weight loss. Or sorry, my weight has gone from 130 kilograms to 126 kilograms, but I see no difference in the mirror. Any advice? Yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, first off, you're not going to see a visible change in the mirror with a four kilo weight loss. Like, uh, ju just just look at the bigger picture. Again, I don't know what your body fat percentage is or, or whatever, but 130 kilos is, that's 286 pounds. I'm assuming if you're 286 pounds, you're probably overweight. <laughs> All right. You know, it's not like 286 pounds, Mr. Olympia contest shredded. It's probably 286 pounds of being overweight. So you've lost four kilos, which is approximately 10 pounds. So you went from 286 pounds to 276 pounds. Let's assume that you have 100 pounds of excess body fat. You know, you have, the, again, I don't know your body fat percentage, so I'm just taking generic numbers. So again, I'm not, I'm just using this as an example for, 
number. If you're listening to this now, I mean, realize that your specific numbers may be different, but just use this as the example. If you have 100 pounds to lose, 100 pounds of excess body fat, which is a lot of excess body fat, like that's a lot of excess blubber around your body, and you lose 10 pounds of that, when you look in the mirror, you're still going to see 90 pounds of excess blubber on your body. So you're not physically going to look any different, right? You still, you're still going to look the exact same. Even if you lose 20 pounds, I mean, okay, you'll be a little bit smaller, but you're still going to look soft. You know, until you start getting down to the point where you're losing the body fat that's covering the muscle and you're getting down to that fine line, now where you're burning the body fat that's actually in between the muscle, that's where you're going to start to see the definition. But if you have just layers of excess body fat, like 100 pounds is a lot of fat, right? So losing 10 pounds, losing 20 pounds, even losing 30 pounds, like you're not going to see any difference in terms of definition. You have to lose all that excess weight first. And then when you get down to the fine line, you know, the, the last little bit of body fat, that's when you're actually going to start to see changes in the mirror, right? For now, you're just going to look like a smaller version of yourself. But don't let that discourage you. You still need to go through this process. You still need to go through all this to trim off that weight. Because if you don't, I mean, you're just, it's just circling your heart and organs and you're just a heart attack waiting to happen, you know, if you're carrying all that extra weight on. But you have to realize the way the body works is you need to lose all that extra weight. And it's only when you get down to the last little bit where you're really going to see the definition showing. And a prime example of this is when you look at competitive bodybuilders and competitive fitness models and stuff like that, like when they're transitioning from lean to ripped, you know, and they're, there's now they've got, you know, the bulk of the excess fat is lost, but now they're getting into burning the, the fat that's in between the individual muscles so that this is where you start to see cuts and striations and definition and visible abdominals. Like in order to have abs, you have to burn that layer of fat that's in between each individual abdominal muscle. So in order to get down to that fat, you have to lose all that big layer of, of fat that's out here first. So if, again, if, if you have again all this fat that's out here, you have to lose that, lose that, lose that, lose that, lose that until you're actually getting down to burning the little individual bits of fat that's in between the actual muscles. So you've got a long way to go. So again, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm just trying to give you the bigger picture of what's going on. You're not going to look any different by dropping 10 pounds of body fat when you've got 100 pounds to lose. You need to lose a lot more before you actually start to see, you know, the, the, the definition and the detail and all that kind of stuff that you want. But, hey, go by the numbers for now. This is when the numbers actually count. So if you are losing weight, that means you're on the right track. So keep doing what you're doing until you, you know, you keep moving that weight forward. As long as you keep dropping weight consistently, uh, you're on the right track. So, again, don't get discouraged by it. Use that as positive reinforcement, but realize that the the, the mirror is, you're, you're a long way from seeing progress in the mirror at this stage. All right, guys, I'm going to clue it up. We went longer than an hour and a half or whatever it's been. I always do go along with these video chats, but I do enjoy it. So thanks again for tuning in. Thanks for your support. I will have the video uh, replay of this along with the timestamps for all the questions covered post it up within the next 24 hours. So have yourself a fantastic weekend and I'll talk to you next week. Take care over and out.